Hey, everybody. Welcome to Build. Uh, my name is Hunter Walker. I'm Yahoo News' White House correspondent. And I'm here with my colleague, Alex Nazarian, who's just out with the best people, Trump's cabinet and the siege on Washington. And as you can tell, and as our president might say, this is the best, most tremendous, and most authoritative look at the Trump cabinet, period. And right all now. the pages are in gold. All the pages. <laughs> it's very expensive to do, but we had to do it. We had to have the best pages. Well, he, when you were in the Oval, he showed you, so you were in the Oval Office, you interviewed Trump in February. It's the best office, too. It's very, <laughs> very few people know that. And he handed you a stack of papers that I guess was supposed to be his key accomplishments. And I know when he had um, the paper, the single piece that was supposed to represent his net worth, it was actually laminated. Are his accomplishments also fully laminated? No, so what happened is his, he said, to his uh, secretary, Madeline Osterhout, Madeline, bring me the my accomplishments, because obviously every president <laughs> needs a list of his own accomplishments. I forget my best accomplishments yeah. of life all the time. Yeah. They're, they're myriad. So, so um, <laughs> she brought in a piece of paper, and he goes, oh, it's not. That's, that's just a letter from Kim Jong-un. So and he just showed it to me. I don't think he was supposed to, but <laughs> and not that I got any intelligence from it. Um, <laughs> Though I am from Russia, so, you know. Well, I actually have a letter from Kim Jong-un right here. No, but, but you know, what I really love about your book, even though the pages aren't laminated, is, you know, you set the stage for not only how we got to Trump, because I think so much ink has been spilled about the 2016 election, but how, how Trump assembled the people around him and how, you know, you had this president who promised populism and promised to drain the swamp, won in an upset, and ended up with these people. And, and it's not necessarily people he knew in advance. I mean, uh, you know, four years ago, Trump's campaign was five people in an office tower. Yes. Um, and you also make a very convincing case that, for lack of a better phrase, this cabinet is uniquely disqualified. You call it a first-class orgy of low-class kleptocrats. You describe their, their agenda as self-interest and maliciousness. And, and what I'm wondering is, what about the road that brought us here do you think made, it, made us vulnerable to getting these types of people in government? Actually, the key word in what you just said, and thank you, um, you are one of the best colleagues, um, <laughs> is assembled, which is not which is not the word I would have used. It's sort of like when my three-year-old decides that he will assemble dinner for himself, and then I am cleaning up after him because he doesn't know how to assemble it. Um, so Trump didn't know how to assemble a cabinet. He discarded Chris Christie's transition plan, uh, and just, you know, Christie was fired from the transition. Uh, so then Bannon, Reince, Priebus, and Jared Kushner basically had the job of putting together this administration, and they, frankly, had no idea what they were doing. Uh, Steve Bannon, you know, I've talked to him, you've talked to him. He's a smart guy. He has no organizational capacity whatsoever, <laughs> right? So, and then Jared, also none. And Ryan's is a, Ryan's is a fun, fundraiser. He was a fundraiser. He was as head of the GOP. Uh, he was... Um, uh, you know, he was basically there to raise funds. The, the RNC, he was there to raise funds. Yeah, you, you make the case at one point in the book that uh, Reince's function was basically um, courting people. He yeah. was basically a professional flirt, if you will, with yeah. donors. And all of a sudden, he's in this organizational administrative capacity as chief of staff. He's Trump's gatekeeper. So, so they had no idea what they were doing. Trump didn't care. Trump was Trump was bu busy relitigating the election. He just won you know, reminding people that there were millions of people who'd voted illegally in California and New York that were not. Um, so it, it, there's the managerial capacity wasn't there, right? Um, and Trump, prom that's exactly what Trump promised. He promised ma populism and managerial competence. And whatever else you think of his administration, those are just not things that we've seen, right? This would be a small, ruthlessly effective federal government that was going to work on the behalf of the people. And, and I, would, I would say that, although he won't admit this, I think in some ways the best analog for, his, uh, for the presidency he wanted in management style is the Bloomberg City Hall, which is attracting smart people from corporate America to come into public service. I think if you, I think somewhere in his brain, that's what he was thinking about. Because of course, he had lived through that. He had seen New York really thrive as a global city under Bloomberg. And 
I think he wanted that same caliber of people, but he also couldn't be bothered to do the work of selecting those people. And the Heritage Foundation did that work. Republican donors did that work. And as a result, Trump got people, he got clinkers, as he told me. I didn't even know that was a word, but it's a word. <laughs> clinkers. Yeah, it was really interesting. So when you, when you guys did sit down together, he admitted that some of the people in the cabinet were quote unquote clinkers. He, he talked about these outside right wing groups that recommended people to him when he was basically running out of time and short on right. names. And he said, I didn't agree with some of them. Right. Um, so it, it's really interesting to see how he haphazardly and non traditionally ended it up with these folks around him and and I mean I guess that's really the whole way he ran his campaign so we shouldn't be surprised necessarily right but the campaign could be propelled by force of personality an administration can't it just does, that's just not how the presidency works yeah, he, he couldn't do this himself and one thing that I found super interesting you talk about how the Christie binders the the you know the sort of names that Christie assembled in his ill-fated tenure as transition chief uh, chief attained mythic status almost and you know with all the infighting some Trump loyalists love to blame Christie for how things went and say he didn't get good names right. and, and Christie and his loyalists love to say oh they threw out our names so it's it's like, you know, I, we don't know what's true, but they ended up with, I guess, the wrong names in the end anyway. Right. Well, so one of the problems was Christie had a lot of lobbyists in the administration, and Trump had said he would have no lobbyists in the administration. <laughs> so then they had to fire Christie, get rid of the binders. But then the people he, that were recommended to him, if they weren't lobbyists, they were they were close enough to corporate America that it blunted the impact of Trump's promise. And, and Trump did sign an executive order that was supposed to close the revolving door between government and private service, except then they, they did the same thing. They gave so many waivers that it essentially nullified his own directive. So one of the stories here is whatever you think of Trump himself, and I know people have, you know, I <laughs> know what many of you think, it's he's incredibly ill-served by the people around him. Um, and I, I don't know how much he realizes that. I think he realizes it from time to time uh, that the people around him don't really care about whatever his message is. They are out there to enrich themselves or to carry out some long-held ideological goal that he doesn't have or n never had, perhaps. Yeah, I, I think some of your reporting uh, undermines the narrative that Christie had done a good job as transition chief because uh, you identified you know, totally inappropriate people that he selected, um, such as folks who were Trump critics and, and you know, floated to run with Hillary, uh, you right. know, a general who was, who was then in the mix. Uh, but the bottom line is we, we have this transition process where um, Trump didn't think he was going to win. Right. Report that. I, I've heard that. We all know that. Right. Um, he kind of got a late start on it and then gets rid of his transition chief partway through. Ends up leaning on these outside groups. This this collection of folks is haphazardly assembled. And, and not only do I think, do some of these people not share his ideology, but they so don't represent it. I mean, you know, as you accuse these people of self-dealing, you also, and, and there's a lot of evidence for it, you note that, you know, Betsy DeVos, she had inherited wealth. Uh, Steve Mnuchin and Wilbur Ross, you described them as sort of bottom feeders who, who in the financial industry, who profited off the financial crisis. So he promised corporate leaders and mavericks, and we end up with sort of an assortment of rich people who kind of fell into it and then fell into the cabinet. It's like the difference between prestige television and what you get it on TBS at like three in the morning. Um, <laughs> I, um, you know, look, for, let's just take uh, our friend Betsy DeVos here. There are, I, I'm a former educator. I taught in, in, in Brooklyn. Um, there are good conservative ideas on education. There are, or at least con ideas that deserve as much serious thought as progressive ideas. Betsy DeVos doesn't have those ideas. She doesn't, she's not an educator. She knows as much about education as I know about, I don't know, knee surgery. I, I just, she doesn't, that's not her field. I mean, she was an activist for school choice, but she doesn't know this stuff. So then we don't actually end up having the conversation about charter schools or a standardized curriculum. We end up having conversations about potential grizzlies, because that's what she said in her confirmation yeah, hearing. When she was making the argument that we should arm teachers, she, she pointed to rural states and said, basically, what if they have bears, right? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> there are bears. <laughs> yeah. They are a thing. 
I, I'm so glad that Bears entered into the gun control yes. debate at that moment. And, you know, so now we've we've got the cabinet. We've seen record turnover in the administration. And I, I guess we should note we, we just saw a... a basically cabinet secretary in waiting leave today, uh, uh, Pat Shanahan. So yeah, let me, uh, you did some excellent reporting on that. You were ahead of that story. Why do you, th I'm going to sort of turn the tables a little bit. Why do you think they allowed Shanahan to get this far right up to basically his hearing where we knew he had these really disturbing, well, can you talk about those allegations and how you think those sort of escaped notice until now? Yeah, so, you know, Shanahan was the deputy defense secretary under General Jim Mattis. When Mattis kind of abruptly resigned after having disagreements with Trump, uh, Shanahan began serving basically as chief of the Pentagon in an acting capacity. And, you know, Trump has a lot of these, amid all this turnover, he has a lot of these acting officials. He says he likes it because it gives him more flexibility and control. Uh, but, you know, we've now undergone the longest period in American history without a secretary of defense. And there were a lot of questions about that. But, you know, a month and change ago, Trump said, no, I'm going to make it official with Shanahan. Um, I am going to nominate him. Now, now, what you must understand, and what I'm not sure the president understands, is that the president saying, I'm going to nominate him, is not enough to make someone secretary of defense. They must be confirmed by the Senate, the Senate Armed Services Committee, and that nomination must be submitted to them. And Trump did not do any of that. Um, this process kind of dragged on. There were there were questions swirling around why it was taking so long. And you know, say, I, we reported that you know the hearing was actually supposed to be today. Ended up getting pushed back to July. Senators were told this was because his background check wasn't done yet, basically. And you know, amid all of this, some of the rumors related to his personal life, where he had this incredibly contentious divorce. There were allegations of violent incidents between him and his wife and their children. It got super messy, which, you know, no matter who is wrong, I don't, I don't want to litigate any of that. That can complicate a background check. Uh, so we started to, you know, air out some of this, and basically within 18 hours, he actually pulled back his nomination. But the big question that I've seen, you know, and this news really just broke, and it gets to some of what you had in your book, is this guy had these problems in his past. How did this not come up when he was Mattis's deputy? How did this not come up sooner? And so there's all these questions about White House vetting, and some of what I've heard is that Trump actually wasn't aware of any of these allegations of violence in the divorce, and you know that Trump was going to get rid of him as soon as he heard of it, which he essentially did after our story was published. But Trump wasn't aware of that, and Trump also, in comments he made last week, didn't seem to be aware of the distinction between, you know, officially nominating someone and him just tweeting it. I mean, when people asked him about this, he said, "I officially put it out. What do you mean? We have a defense secretary." Uh, and, and we did not, and we do not. So another cabinet casualty. Well, you know, it, you, you said Trump wasn't aware. It's interesting because when I was in the Oval, I said, do you, you think it's interesting that your former campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, has a, a consulting firm, a lobbying firm, called Turnberry Solutions? Well, Turnberry is the Trump golf course in Scotland. Nobody would miss the implication of having that. And he just didn't know. He just didn't know that he, and he didn't know that Ryan Zinke, our friend uh, Mr. Zinke there, the former <laughs> interior secretary, had gone to work as a consultant to Corey. He just had and look, he's the he's the leader of the free world. I get that he does not every detail is going to be just on ready recall, but still, I mean, you had if if you're sitting there claiming that you have the toughest ethics ethics pledge in American history. How do you not know that your your former campaign ma manager is brazenly profiting off your name? And he was he's, he was clearly displeased when I told him. He was he was annoyed. I mean, you could you could tell. It's it's weird to have that feeling of breaking the news to, to the, the president. president. Yes, it? it's it's a little uh, uncomfortable. And remember, Ronnie Jackson was just the head the VA, right? There had been rumors about him and his loose prescription policy for some time. <laughs> So how did they not see that, and why did they not stop it before it became a huge story, and then John Tester and others blew the whistle, and it became a disaster, just like this Shanahan? They keep stepping into disasters they could very easily avoid. Well, I, I think one reason for it uh, is something you touch on in your book, which is that due to all the chaos that's gone on around this, uh, 
we have a large number of remaining vacancies in key posts in government. And that, that obviously makes it harder to do do your job. But but another figure I want to zero in on, and, and really it's, it, it's not a figure, it's a lack thereof, is at one point you say that there are now easily more than 50 ethics investigations into past and present members of the Trump cabinet. And when I see a journalist uh, have a sentence like, easily more than 50, the, the signal that I'm getting from you is that there's literally too many to count and track accurately. It's too fast moving and there's too much. So are you saying that there are more ethics probes into this cabinet than you can count and keep track of during the process of writing a book? So let's go through them. He had 17, I think, by the time he left, including, you know, look, you know, just, uh, I mean, some of them being so bizarre that uh, that that are almost uh, difficult. We're talking, you know, both congressional and inspector general, and then potentially White House ethics officials. Even you know, the early at first people thought, well, this White House ethics office is going to be toothless, but eventually they just had to grow teeth because there was so much to chew on. Um, I think seventeen, also fifteen, sixteen for Zinke. Um, you know, obviously, Tom Price, Health and Human Services, his flights, including $25,000 between Philadelphia and New York. Uh, no, I'm sorry, D.C. and Philadelphia. Uh, first class flights. Yeah, yeah. a penchant for first yes, class travel. Yes. That's often what it cost me to fly between <laughs> D.C. and um, her security personnel, uh, many other, th you know, him, pr again, private flights, um, just... Ben, so, ben Carson, the thirty-one thousand dollar furniture set that he blamed his wife for. So it's no. So th this is a, this is actually a, a good segue into what I think is my favorite thing in your book. What I really love about your book, and what I think everyone really wants to know. Uh, in the course of your reporting, you unearthed all these incredible anecdotes. You can call it gossip. I know that you told me I couldn't. You told me I couldn't. So, so the gossip. Let's get to the gossip. There's all this great stuff in Alex's book, uh, where he just finds quirks. I mean, it, one of my favorite is Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary. Uh, Alex reported that when he was going through prep for his confirmation hearings, they had these mock rooms. Murder, murder boards. The murder, yeah. the murder boards. Uh, I almost said murder boards. Um, yeah. where, where they were conducting these, these dry runs for like what the Senate hearings would look like. Wilbur brought his wife and a young man, and everyone was like, what's he doing there? It was Wilbur's tennis pro, because he had tennis lessons scheduled for that day, and he wanted to make sure not to miss a minute. So he had the pro just waiting for, waiting there to go into the hearings. So it, it's stuff like that that makes your book just, just so rich and, and brings, you know, this argument you're making that his cabinet, you know, is unethical, frankly, to light in a really interesting way. What are some of your favorite anecdotes that you found? I, um... Good question. I, 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 there was the, there was a story that someone in the EPA told me about the time uh, Scott Pruitt was in a western state, uh, somewhere in a high desert, I believe, and he was walking around, and they told him there were rattlesnakes, and he sort of freaked out and got <laughs> back into the van and didn't go out the whole day. No, I just like I like these little stories because these the, a lot of these guys just they want they want to seem so tough, and and so kind. You know, they all want to be their own version of Trump, but they're but but some of these stories do show their frailties, and I I don't know if that necessarily humanizes them, but it, but at least it's amusing. Uh, you know, one of the one of the funny things that um, I heard was actually sort of sad. I, I spoke to someone um, someone you actually know quite well, who 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 had worked closely with Tom Price, and this person said, "Look, I remember when he had a mustache, and we called him Ned Flanders. He was such a nice guy. <laughs> he would have people over." I don't know the guy who was taking $25,000 flights, who wasted half a million dollars of your money throughout you know, about six months, because, and this is what his press people said, he was going to see real Americans. He was leaving Washington to go see real Americans. She said, I don't know who that guy was. She said, being in, when he was a congressman, he was a nice, normal guy. And suddenly there he is, you know, living like a third world despot. Um, and, and how does that happen to someone? So, so actually, I don't, how does that happen is one of the questions that I think will take us a long time to, to answer. 
why why this administration could not enforce its own, why it couldn't live at, out its own convictions, right? Because Trump clearly has convictions. He believes certain things very strongly. I, I loved the, and, and maybe this is my bias as kind of a, a New York guy, but I loved some of the stuff you unearthed about Chris Christie and his relationships with the rest of the president's inner circle. I mean, you just have all of this incredible reporting from those moments when, you know, during the campaign, Christie was one of the first major Republicans to endorse Trump. Uh, he stayed by his side, uh, by Trump's side, even despite the fact that you, you say his wife, Mary Pat Christie, had a loathing for yes. Donald Trump. Uh, he then stuck it out, became head of the transition, even despite his bad relationship with Jared Kushner, whose father he put in jail. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, prison, excuse me. And then, you know, the Access Hollywood tapes happened. Yeah. And, and as Steve Bannon put it to you, you know, the people who were sticking by Trump got on a plane. On Billy Bush Saturday, which is what Bannon calls it. That's the, Saturday after the after the, the tape is on Friday. Um, I, that's a national holiday now, actually. Yes, B yes, Billy yes. Bush Saturday. That's the the you know yeah. uh, second Sunday in October or wh what have you. <laughs> uh, but but they all get on the plane and Bannon said Christie was not on the plane. Right. right. And in fact, Christie was on local New York sports radio station WFAN trashing yes. Donald Trump. A slight no one ever forgave. No, and tr Trump. You know, someone asked me the other day, is Christy going to get back into this administration? <laughs> not as, I think, not as long as Jared has a pulse. And not <laughs> as long as Bannon still has friends in the administration, which he doesn't have so many of, but enough to, I think, to keep Christie out. For but, but, but just for you guys to understand how dead Chris Christie's prospects in the administration are, and also how much reporting Alex did on the cabinet, I mean, these scenes you got include, you know, when Christie was told he was no longer transition head, uh, pleading for his job with Steve Bannon for four hours, uh, which I, I found amazing. But then yeah. also, my favorite election night, before Christie's lost his job, Trump's already kind of annoyed with This him. is your reporting, of course. This is I cite you in the book. You. This was mine. The cell phone. The cell no, phone. No, this is not mine. The cell phone. Not mine. The I wish. Okay. Well, let's let's you, describe I, it. I've read your story about the cell phone. I the dirt that when 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 Obama calls Christie and Christie gives. This is not the, mine. Your, He's giving me too much credit. The guy's too generous. But he he gets this great story, story that um, on election night Obama calls Christie and says, you know, I want to get on the phone to the customary congratulations and Trump the germaphobe sees Christie trying to hand him this phone and he, he curses. He says, you know, give the effing president my phone number. Uh, and that really, to me, was like the ultimate sign of how dead Chris Christie was. Right, and Christie's trying to edge into the photos once they win. That, that I think, was mine. Yeah, okay, that, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, I think he wanted to write the victory speech. Right, because Christie's a Johnny come lately. He realizes he'd made a mistake after, after uh, Access Hollywood, uh, <laughs> And, and now he's trying to edge back in, right? And he's thinking, what am I going to get in this administration? Right? He badly wants to be chief of staff. Ryan's gets that. He'd want it to be vice president. In his four-hour begging session to Bannon, I guess yeah. he, he said, please, I said, my wife's going to kill four me. Hours, right? in, in four hours. I, I, mean, I, it's a, I mean, unreal. Um, I didn't make a good. I didn't. I realized I did not make a good Bridgegate joke in the book, and now <laughs> now that really pains me. Well, well, we'll save that one for the sequel. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. I I, I now you made your Bridgegate joke. I, I have to say my favorite Trump cabinet story uh, is that Wilbur Ross. Uh, I, I realized at one point he was regularly padding around the West Wing in in custom made velvet loafers emblazoned with the seal of the Commerce Department. Uh, and I found pictures of him at events, and, and it seems that Wilbur Ross has a massive collection of velvet loafers. A source told me that their mother, because of course, uh, basically Wilbur Ross and old women are the only people who are doing this, <laughs> their mother had seen Wilbur Ross in this high-end velvet loafer store in Palm Beach, because that's a thing. And, and, and so I guess he, he's one of their best customers. He's got a habit. That is, that is by far, that makes Wilbur Ross my favorite cabinet member. But I have to ask you, after all of this work you've done, who is your favorite member of the Trump cabinet and why? Well, it's the man who wanted to use mattress from the Trump Hotel. <laughs> who among us? Who among us? <laughs> who, who doesn't? Who doesn't? Who doesn't stay in a hotel and think what I really want is that soiled mattress? <laughs> 
who needed, uh, you know, his security detail to break down the door of a Capitol Hill townhouse because he was inside uh, napping. Uh, you know, a man who likes $136 lotion. Again, who among us? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you only spend $90... I mean, I, I'll tell you, I think $132 lotion is actually brings you much more bang for your buck, yeah. but we'll, we'll talk about that. Not to mention a man who's dismantled every... Regu you know, mo many, many regulations uh, that the Obama admi administration had put in place regarding clean air, clean water, clean energy, and that would be, of course, our friend uh, Edward Scott Pruitt, uh, also known as the possum. <laughs> uh, for un unclear reasons, I didn't. Rep this is not my original reporting, but he was known as the possum at the University of Kentucky. I, I think we've got more for you to find out in the sequel. Uh, but you know, I, I until we get that book, I think everyone should grab this one and the just the possum. Uh, but yeah, that's a title, right? There, <laughs> yeah, the possum. Know? But but this book is just really awesome, and you know, a, a big a big thought that I always have when covering the Trump White House is too many people pay attention to the tweets and the cable news controversy of the moment. Meanwhile, you know, there's a very large government out there, and these agency heads and these lower level staffers are actually maybe the people having the most consequential effect on our lives and society. Absolutely. And, you know, they're not always, as we just talked about, the president's not even aware of what they're doing necessarily. They're not always connected to him. And I don't think um, enough people know the stories of the Trump cabinet. So I'm, I'm so happy for you and so proud that, you know, you have dug in all these books about the Trump election and the Trump White House. No one has really focused on the cast of characters around him. It's so important, and I really encourage people to read this book. So well, it's very kind of you. I, I just, to that point... You know, we, 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 we both live in Washington. We both know, we've both been inside the West Wing. It's small. The yeah. White House is small. The West Wing is even, is obviously a very small part of the White House. The federal bureaucracy is very large. <laughs> Those federal buildings on uh, independence or constitution, they're very large. And that's where most of the work happens. That's where, that's where the so-called unelected bureaucrats do the bidding of the political appointees who are now conservative operatives who've been waiting to do this work for at least since the middle of the Obama, the first Obama term, I think. And in the case of the Department of the Interior, for a brief moment, these other buildings had a personal flag for Ryan Zinke flying over them. So yes. if you want to hear about this, this work that's making up our government, if you want to hear these stories of velvet loafers and strange townhouses and, and tennis pros and personal flags, I really, really encourage you to get uh, Alex's book. But in the meantime, I think Thank you. everyone Thank you. has heard more than enough from us. So I'd, I'd love to open it up to questions if anyone uh, wants to ask the man himself. You mentioned confronting Trump about um, not keeping his uh, ethics promises, and, so, and obviously he's going to deny anything negative said about him. But what do you, would you say to his diehard followers who kind of also, who, just to make, make them see or admit that he's not keeping his promises? Or do you think they're just incapable of seeing that? <sighs> Well, I say that as my mother is a is a is a diehard Trump supporter, um, and uh, I think I think to to I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters. I think I think there's a sense among Trump supporters is that he, that he is ill served by some of the people around him. I do think they understand that. I mean, look, Trump supporters. There's many. I do think they. I do think that is commonly understood in Trump world, but it's not his fault. Because he is obviously so much better than they are. He's, he's above reproach. Um, I think, you know, you hear, sure, he should tweet less, he should be a little nicer, but you don't hear, you know, the stuff about the emoluments clause, about the, about the, corrupt, the alleged corruption, I don't know that that bothers his supporters. I, I just don't know what gives you the impression that the president wouldn't be able to admit fault. I mean, this is a, a very, very uh, self-aware administration, no? Remarkably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, Alex uh, and Hunter, <laughs> if you want to weigh in. So uh, one of the things that um, uh, you've seen if you've covered Washington over the last few decades um, is that uh, uh, the cabinet has become less and less uh, powerful over the years. Cabinet secret secretaries have less autonomy. Uh, they have uh, 
w sort of weaker relationships with the president. All power seems to be uh, centralized inside the White House, which essentially makes all policy and uh, uh, legislative strategy. Um, is, is the Trump uh, cabinet just a, a continuation of that evolution, um, or because Trump you know, runs such a strange <laughs> White House and has <laughs> busted so many norms, um, has that changed in any way? Is this in any way a more powerful cabinet than, say, the Obama cabinet or cabinets before? I think that's an incredibly good question, Dan. All right, uh, Dan's, Dan's our boss. <laughs> yeah, Dan's our boss. It, no, it's it's because it gets to the kind of the the physics of the of the executive branch and how much, right? It's there's the some of it is how much oversight does Congress have over what the executive branch does, but also how much power does the ex how, how much power does the executive branch take away from the rest of well, from Congress, and then how much of that power is concentrated in the president himself? I do think it's it's odd because this president considers himself sort of the the state, and at the same time, he seems to be unaware that a lot of incredibly consequential work is happening without seemingly his own knowledge. Didn't he at one point say, I am the government? Yes, he told Laura Ing Ingram that. Um, I don't need all those people. He said something like that. So, but the people are there. So, that, and that's where Congress, what, 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 it, what we've seen now is the House Oversight Committee, Ways and Means, they have said, wait a second, we want to know what Wilbur Ross is doing. We want to know what Steve Mnuchin is doing. And I actually think those investigations could bear more fruit than the investigations into Trump, because Trump is going to claim executive privilege. His lawyers are not going to give us tax returns or you know, any, there's not going to be, a, I don't think, a lot of movement on that front. But there, there could be congressional oversight over the agencies. And that could, I think the power has to return to Congress. Whether you're a conservative or a progressive, I think you should believe that Congress should have much more power to sort of oversee and direct the executive. And right now, the executive seems to have much more power than it did some generations before. Yeah, I, one of the things I really found interesting that you wrote about is the history of cabinets, right? And only some cabinets in history have had enough power or enough individual style that we even remember them. I mean, the, the two everyone thinks of is Lincoln's cabinet that was famously dubbed the, the team of rivals. And then uh, JFK's cabinet, which, uh, you know, it was tragically ironic that it was called the best and the brightest. And, and right. really, other than that, a lot of cabinets have not been memorable. I, I would I would not necessarily make the argument that the Trump cabinet is not powerful. Uh, because as we were saying, a lot of stuff is getting done, but I think what you're hearing from everything Alex just said and you know what I was saying earlier about this situation with the Secretary of Defense, the question is, do they have that power because the president is disengaged and unaware of, their, of what they're doing? Is that the reason that um, they are playing a major role more than him wanting to even delegate that responsibility to them. And, and I, I would go with that, that theory that, you know, this is kind of, I don't know, I would love to hear what you would name this cabinet, but I would say, if anything, it, it, it's sort of the, the, the autopilot cabinet, you know, where the president's over here focusing on his Twitter and his, his personal interests and obsessions and, and, you know, governments being run by these folks who have their own different agendas. And they all, some of them have their own preoccupations. So where a lot of the really consequential work is happening on the deputy level, and the assistant secretary level, those are people whose names you're not going to hear on MSNBC or CNN or Fox News. They're just not pe people who attract that much news, but they're the people who really know the issues and who know what their political um, sort of patrons want, right? So if you... And, th and that would be true. Those people would be consequential in any administration of any of either political party. They're just not being overseen right now the way they would in another administration because nobody right. It's 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 not of an auto. It's it, uh, autopilot would almost be generous. Well, the, I noticed you sort of are, are on the verge of dodging my question there. No. Alex. And as a fellow reporter, I have to push back on this. What, what would your brand be for this cabinet? Is this the best people or do you have another name for them? Um, 
That's almost I, a brand in and of itself. Yeah. That that sigh there. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, right. Uh, I, I, it's hard. It's hard to see how these people have served Trump well or the American people well. I just. It's hard to make that argument, knowing what Trump said he would do when he. Holding Trump to his own words, I don't see how these people have carried out that mission. So, you know, when Trump, you know, when Trump, when I was in the Oval and Trump was saying this person's great and that person's great, you didn't get the sense that he believed any of it. You felt the sense he had to say it because that's what you're supposed to say about the people who work for you. You know, there, I love were, all my children. There were two people you singled out as being uniquely capable and, I, I think you said, decent individuals. And that's uh, Jim Mattis, the former yes. defense secretary, and also Nikki Haley, the ambassador to the UN. And, and they're both gone, right? Yeah. And look, I think the chief of staff's office, when um, Ke John Kelly was chief of staff, uh, Kirsten Nielsen has been uh, very heavily criticized for her work at DHS. Uh, for the border policy, the child separa family separation policy. But when she was in the chief of staff's office, she was well respected and frankly feared. And that was probably good for an administration that had been, well, uh, for a West Wing that was so freewheeling. And there was also uh, Zach Fuentes was in that suite, who some believe wrote the anonymous op-ed for the New York Times. And he was, uh, again, not liked by everyone, but effective. Rob Porter, who of course had to leave because of very serious domestic abuse allegations. And that group did prove effective in trying to manage Trump for a while, but only for a limited time. And ultimately, they were undone by various forces, including <coughs> some errors that they made. So, yeah, I mean, you talk about Rob Porter. This is between uh, the now former acting Defense Secretary Shanahan between uh, Andy Puzder, who was briefly nominated right. uh, for Secretary of Labor, and Porter. There's now three people who've had domestic violence allegations in the, in the Trump right. administration. Right, not to mention uh, Bannon has had those as well, stemming from much further back, of course, many allegations about Trump. And it's, it just speaks to kind of the, I mean, it's hard not to take that all as symptoms of a more profound problem with this, with, with this cabinet. So, like, you've got two reporters up here who have covered this administration nonstop, in your case, at, at book length. And, and both of us seem to have trouble quickly recalling uh, the number of scandals and the number of investigations. But I do think if people want really good rundown, they should, they should definitely check out your book. So I, I thank you for writing it, and I thank you for taking the time to chat with Thank me. you, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much. <laughs> 